bit difficult to what you were saying before to combine like to have like you know to combine the architecture and the furniture maybe in one design one person would design that space is sometimes like the, i guess for some architects the dream to you know like to have to design yeah. the space and design the furniture and design everything in it but to me that's the most frightening part it's like i feel like that would take so long mm -hmm. that you would Yes, but there's there's some good examples of it. Even uh, even if you look at like classic examples, uh, the work of Frank Lloyd Wright and some of the built-in furniture that he's done. Yeah. Um, and yeah. there are many other examples, and um, I'm sure for some reason the best examples are not going to come to mind right now. But, you know, there's many good cases of built-in furniture, which is nonetheless shaping. It's a fancy way of, you know, saying that you, the architecture that you're shaping allows for you to use it in other ways as well. Oh, there is the mm -hmm. Anne house by So Fujimoto in Japan, uh, that the whole house is made of different platforms. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen mm -hmm. it. It looks like a bunch of sticks and floating boxes. I haven't. Oh, my God. Um, uh, okay, like after this, I, I can <laughs> like, pull it up and show an example. <laughs> uh, but basically, the whole house, you know, the floor becomes the seating and the mm. table and everything. You know, it's a bunch of surfaces mm. in different heights. So you find yourself, you know, surfaces to but use. We like... categorize things as tables, as seats, as shelves. But in the end, they're just surfaces in different heights. You know, what differentiates a shelf from mm. a table it's basically we decide what to label things. So now if you have a landscape of different surfaces and all, now you find use to those surfaces as you need them. Um, I, I like yeah, to see it like, that way. You know, like a chair, I'm just like, I, I, I get like so um, reactionary with these kind of designs. And they, they, you know, they, I get so reactionary in the way that, oh, right, you know, great. And how you're supposed to move your chair then? And how you're supposed to go out in and out, you know, like of the, you know, like if, if you can't move your chair, it's really hard for you to go in, you know, like and sit under the table, you know, and put your legs under the table. So that's what was happening to me in architecture school. I would see like projects that have like, you know, a real concept behind them. And, and I would react so badly <laughs> on details, you know, about how they don't work or how about you can't clean them or how, you know, like they're uncomfortable and they don't work. And that's why we have like, you know, simple chairs and why do we have to do like this? <laughs> so I was, I was terrible. You know, like the, the minute you say to me, like, oh, the surface, you know, the wall becomes, you know, like this, it, it might be like the nicest thing I've ever seen, but then I completely destroy mm -hmm. it in my head because, you know, like <laughs> I just, <laughs> I'm like, this is terrible. <laughs> it's like I feel like in me there is always a battle of you know like the aesthetics that I like and then I bring it to my personal you know like way of life and I say oh no that's rubbish I would never do that you know like <laughs> and I've always struggled with that because sometimes it takes away the actual you know like concept and the and and the quality that some of these works, you know, have. And I completely destroy that in my head because, you know, like I'm so reactionary to mm -hmm. to anything that is innovative, you know? Yeah, and it's a dance, <laughs> right? It's a dance I'm between terrible. the use and the function and yeah. the structural and the yeah. materials and, yeah. and the aesthetics, yeah. everything. And even what you were mentioning, like the cleaning of it, that's something no one teaches in school, mm -hmm. how to design oh, for no cleaning. Way. You know, but that's a real yeah. problem in, you know, in, in the actual lately, real world. You have to think about that. Yes. <laughs> I have been, you know, like, uh, <laughs> I have been really mad with matte surfaces lately. <laughs> and the way to clean them. And I'm like, why? I think shiny is better. But, you know, like, anyway, shiny is not good either. Anyway, the best thing is to have a cleaner. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the best thing is to not clean yourself. But who, who has that? Anyway, you yeah. know, like, so you get, like, I, I get something that is of, like, big quality and huge, you know, like, architectural, you know, like, uh, effort and concept. And in my head, I'm so cynical that I just, you know, completely go to the details and if it's, like, comfortable or uncomfortable. And 
that's it. Yes. Th that's why I... Uh... <laughs> yes, and Katarina, I think it's that's dangerous. That's why I will never be a good actor. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's dangerous having the both of us here on the stage because we can talk for hours. Um, yeah, hours. But it's, oh, it's the time. Oh, it's yes, time to start it's time. So oh. uh, if you guys want to join us here in the center stage, um, I would like to yeah, officially I'll kick off the, the dive live. So welcome, everyone. Welcome again to the Sunken Blimp stage. It's a pleasure having everyone here again on this beautiful Friday. Um, today we have a very special guest and, and some people are still staring at the Barcelona chair, which I think it's okay. You can look at it. Um, <laughs> That's fine. So um, it's, it's such an honor to have such an amazing speaker here with us at the Sunken Blimp stage. Uh, and I'll do a little introduction and introduce her presentation in a little bit. And first, I'd like to say, if this is your first time here with us, um, we host these Dive Lives every Friday. And the idea of the Dive Live is to bring a speaker with a very interesting, you know, set of stuff to show, right? And I use the word stuff because it could be anything from a, a life philosoph a philosophical perspective to a project uh, or a presentation about themselves. And the idea is to bring that person that in between like 20 and 30 minutes, they showcase that to the community in the theme of, you know, design, architecture, or generalizing that into the future of living somehow, or the, what it is to live, right? What it is to be human and interact with things around us. So um, it's an honor to present Caterina Camprani. And for those that don't know, Caterina, she studied architecture in the National Technical University of Athens. And that's where she received her diploma in 2006. After that, she did her postgraduate studies in product design and interactive systems. Katarina started her personal project then, The Uncomfortable. And in this, in this project, she balanced humor, art, design, and she analyzes and redesigns everyday objects in order to make them inconvenient. And then the rest, I don't want to spoil too much because she has an amazing presentation uh, for us today. So without further ado, Thank you, Katerina, for joining us, and the stage is all yours. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for all the clapping. Um, first of all, um, I want to say that I'm very excited to be on the virtual stage of Sunken Blim because it's the first time I use a platform like this, and uh, I really enjoyed uh, preparing the presentation and you know like doing the slides and putting them around in the space and I don't know it got me really excited um so uh so basically I'm gonna say my name is Katerina Camprani I, I design deliberately inconvenient everyday objects uh, like the ones that I have above me if you see the slide that is above me uh so basically yeah it's like uh, stuff that I completely, well, that I rendered useless. And um, today, uh, I would like to tell you the story of how and why it all began. And I'm going to talk it through through 20 different chairs or and non-chair designs, and then talk about how uh, this personal project turned into something bigger that I, I wouldn't expect. Um, so I will um, walk around the stage. I'm gonna go up the up there on the upper platform there, and you can come and join me so I, I can show you all the different uh, all the different chairs that I want to show you. Let me see. Great, cool. So I want to start with this uh, the, the my high school chair, basically a, school, a, a classic school chair. I don't know how school chairs are in the in the states. This is how they are in the in Greece. They're classic plywood chair, and I want to start from there because I think that's where all the mistakes start happening, which I think it's common for a lot of people. And the first mistake that I did in my life was a choice uh, because I was a gifted student, and so uh, I had a problem. I, I, I basically I um, I decided to study the wrong thing because um, back in 1999 that I, I was finishing high school and I had to make the choice of what to do with my life um, the create the choices of uh, doing something creative here in Greece they were not uh, many especially in the public public university system where we all usually go 
if you don't have a lot of money anyway to study um, in a private institution. So basically this was architecture school that was a very prestigious school and if you would be an architect in, in Athens, uh, in Greece, it, it would be like the best thing I could do. Uh, and then there were other like graphic design schools and stuff that were not the, the diploma was not as high as that. So me being a gifted student and also me um, being very good at arts, it was basically like it was funneling me to a one-way street um, because, you know, like my teachers felt that, you know, I would be my, you know, like my potential in scientific stuff would be underutilized if I would go for something like graphic design. Um, and something that was also very prestigious, which was art school, was kind of like a big no-no in my middle class family because it meant like that, you know, basically that I would be poor and that I wouldn't have jobs and that it would it'd be hard to get by. So, you know, like it was just like a, a one-way street to go in architecture school. And, we, and back then we didn't even have design schools or anything like that. It was just like a few options. Uh, so the first time I came into contact with something like that was like very designy uh, and the, the design object uh, was in my second year of architecture uh, where we went in Barcelona, in Barcelona for an educational trip and we visited the pavilion of Mies Matero and I was really impressed with the pavilion and the space but I was more impressed from, by the chair. <laughs> Um, and basically, not only, you know, like I like the design, but also at that moment, I was so, so tired when we arrived at the pavilion and I sat down on this chair and it felt like heaven to me. <laughs> and, you know, like, I think th this connection of, you know, like seeing the object in real life and, you know, like uh, coming in contact with it, like really made me fell in love with it. And I was using it in, in all my sketches and renders and all that stuff at the point. Um, and I also wanted to show you this other chair, this um, uh, chair that is like, um, <clears throat> uh, it is uh, an installation uh, by Mario Navarro. Basically, this chair I'm showing to you because that's how exactly I felt and when I was in architecture heaven. school. And you know, oh, I'm sorry, if you can mute your mic, okay. or is it me? Can you mute your mic? Please? Yes. Okay, good. Cool. Uh, so around my third year of studies of architecture, I started feeling very miserable because uh, um, I think my real problem was that uh, architects produce very permanent structures in the city grid and that they are responsible for things that stay there for decades. And that made me feel a great pressure by the fact that, you know, like that I couldn't have room for mistakes. Let, let, let's say that uh, in a hypothetical scenario where I would design a building and then after building it in my head, I would not feel confident for my design choices. I couldn't feel that I would just say, oh, well, okay, we, we tried in this one, maybe it didn't work. Oh, well, let's try it to the other one for the other, for the next one building. I just felt that, you know, like you can just like make something and then if you didn't like it, you can just demolish it. So this made me feel like very restricted. And at that point, you know, like I was growing up, I was uh, learning myself, you know, and all that. And, and I was very interested in humor. I liked stand-up comedy. I liked reading comics. And I started making funny pictures and videos. But I didn't feel that that could be combined with architecture because, that, you know, that was way too serious. I didn't feel that there was room for that in there, in that school. The problem is that this school was so prestigious and the best school I could be in, so I couldn't quit it because I couldn't find something that, you know, like I would convince my parents that's better or even myself, not even my parents. So, you know, like I decided to push through, I got my degree and I thought, you know, like maybe I would do something later. And at that time where I got my degree and that, and we go to the next slide now with all the chairs. Uh, at that time then, uh, I started like being um, very often online, you know, like and start watching like design blogs. Uh, that was like a thing back then. That was around 2008, 2010. And my two favorite design blogs were uh, Swiss Miss, which is a very old blog. I don't think it exists anymore. <laughs> and Design Boom, which okay. That one I think is maybe some of you know. 
so this uh, well, apart from architecture stuff, uh, they were full of smart, playful design projects. And I remember really liking that chair by Peter Bristol that looks like it's levitating, but it's really supported in one leg that's connected to the plate under the carpet. And I thought, oh, that's so cool, you know, like. Um, and then, you know, like you had chairs that looked like cactus and chairs that looked like they were swinging themselves. And I also included in that slide another project that I really like, which was not from that era, but I really like it. And it's really representative of, for me for what, what were the projects that I really liked and enjoy, enjoyed seeing, which is this um, uh, this project by Clark Barthley, which was uh, basically he was experimenting with wood bending, and he made this piece that is it, just the arms of the chair, so it's the armchair, <laughs> but but it doesn't have a sitting, so he just provides you with the arms, and you have to provide the sitting, so that's why it has a stool in the in the middle of this thing, and I thought that you know like things like that that made me happy, you know when when I saw them and stuff. So let's go to the next chair now. Oops. <laughs> so this is like uh, one of my designs of that era uh, and this is uh, the basically it's a huge chair that is essentially a table <laughs> um, so at that point I was fascinated by things that were out of scale um, and but that also as an architect I had to also put a function on that so that was supposed to be functional for these narrow kitchens that we have in Greece in small apartments and you can only fit the table against the wall and supposedly the back of the chair would be something that could work like as like a, a, a space that you could put things like magazines and I don't know what anyway. So so I used to do this stuff and I was really proud of that design. I put it in my portfolio, so I'm really proud. Now I, I don't like it at all. I think it's very naive. Um, but anyway, that's, that, that's the things I was doing. Basically, I wanted to have fun. Um, so... Um, at that point, I thought, okay, uh, let's do, let, let me do something different. Like, let me do like a postgraduate uh, uh, degree on design. Like maybe now it's the time to, 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 to try and change my career and actually uh, try and do something, uh, be a designer, do all these fun things. The designer do fun things in my head. That, that was it. Uh, so I went to this school. Uh, in a Greek island, which was very nice, and, uh, and that school was uh, was um, a postgraduate program about design, but it wasn't only about the design of objects; it was also the design of interactive systems like websites and apps and services. And basically, as soon as we went there, the teachers uh, kept on posing that question: uh, that was, uh, what is design? What is design? They were kept on saying, "You don't know what design is. We'll tell you what design is." <laughs> So basically, they were saying to us that good design is not about form, that good design answers questions and solves problems, and that the role of the designer is not to make beautiful things. The role of the designer is to observe, identify a problem, and then design a solution that solves that problem. And that's how innovative products come to life. Uh, so if we apply that way of thinking on a chair, the design thinking, the problem uh, or the user's goal is to rest their body. That's what they want to do when they have a chair. So the chair is simply just a, a tool that helps that helps us achieve this goal, right? So uh, in this way of thinking, I think in this way of thinking, Alejandro Aravena observed that the tribe of Indians, the Ayurel, prefer to sit on the ground and sometimes use a strip of cloth like a belt to relieve their waist and free their hands. So yeah, so what it means to sit down, maybe it means to sit down on the ground. Maybe you don't have to sit down on the chair, right? right? But what would be the, the, the product that would help you in that way of sitting? A, a belt that you would strap around your body to keep you supported. He presented that product in, two, in 2010 at the Forest Salon in Milan, and he named it Chairless. Uh, and he does not he does not claim that this replaces a chair. Uh, this is supposed to be addressed to people who would choose to sit on the ground, more young people or at a concert, at a festival or on the beach. And of course, I, I don't know if like it's really comfortable, but I think it is a good example to reconsider what it means to sit and rest our body. And what tool could we use for that that it's not traditionally shaped as a chair? 
And then underneath that, we see another product from back then, um, 2010s, all that, which has the same name, uh, but it has a completely different function and form. Um, so Noon basically, uh, Noon Chairless is an exoskeletal system that you can wear and use it as a standing stool whenever, uh, whenever you want to rest. And they were very popular at that point. Although they have seen like too many exoskeletal systems in 2010. <laughs> uh, it is mainly aimed at people who work standing for many hours, like production line workers or doctors in surgeries, and they, it gives them the opportunity to rest their body at any time, anywhere. So none of these products are really chairs, but I have grouped them with chairs because the end goal of the user is similar to rest our body. But, but if, if we see that, so we start, so now you start to, to think about, but then what is a chair? What defines actually a chair or a sitting space, right? So let's go over here and talk about these two models. So basically when the user comes in contact with an object, any object. Two things happen in the brain. The one has to do with understanding what the object is, and the other one is to understand how to use that object. The mental model is to understand what the object is. Basically, it is a representation that we have in our brains that connects what we see to a previously known function. And this could be before, because of previous experience. For example, someone uh, observed using someone else using that object or you have tried to use the object yourself and you figured out how it works, or someone might have told you or explained to you how that object works, or maybe you have seen a manual. And, uh, and I use this, uh, this image of this uh, guy uh, because it's like, uh, because he probably has never seen a chair before in his life and no one told, told him how to use it and he doesn't have a mental model of a chair, so he, he's not using it correctly. And it's also, it's also from a meme that says you're, you, you're not doing it wrong if nobody knows what you're doing. And that has to do with, you know, like what is the object you're using? And then we have the conceptual model, which is understanding how to use an object. Um, all objects gives us information and these are called affordances, affordances and limitations. And these are very common um, design terms, like when you are a design student. I don't know if you're an architecture student, if you have heard things like that. I certainly didn't. So when the parts of an object are visible, uh, the brain recognizes the physical and logical constraints. Uh, we, maybe we can understand the size of the object relatively to our bodies, if something is a movable part or not, if we can push or turn something and our, all other sorts of information. So at that point, the brain gets into simulation mode while trying to figure out the objects. So seeing the chair, the, the chair of uh, the, the rocking chair, we recognize from the curved base that this chair can rock sideways. And even seeing it, it might stimulate to some people the movement from left to right. And, but that happens it just if your brain works like that. <laughs> so this chair is designed by the French artist Zach Carlman, and he is most known for his masochist teapot uh, on the cover of the Don, Norm Don Norman's book, The Design of Everyday Objects. And if you haven't read it, I definitely recommend it. It's a, it's a very good book. So Don Norman explains really well how everyday object gives off signals of how they want to be used. And the good design re relies a lot on it. And this has an application not only in design of objects, but in everything that has to do with visual communication. So basically, uh, by, 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 think, by learning, you know, like terms like these, uh, and being in the design school, I started realizing that design, it, it, it was probably not what I thought it was. So as a designer, I was supposed to provide innovative solutions to a problem, which in extreme cases, like the ones I showed you before in the two chairless chairs, it might mean to totally step away from the mental model of an object, because that new solution would, would be something completely different in form, but also to, for this form to design a very good conceptual model that will help the user understand immediately how to use it. So basically that's, that's what I've been taught in that postgraduate program. That every time I have to think 
of, of how to step away from the mental model of the object that I want to design. And of course, I realized by going in the industrial design schools that, you know, like industrial designs, industrial design means that objects are mass produced. And this is also a big responsibility. <laughs> it's not only architects that have a big responsibility, designers have also a huge responsibility. Um, and I didn't like that. <laughs> so maybe the playful projects that I liked, I realized they are just experimental projects or even art and not really, you know, like design products. But the, but, the, but the thing is like, and I want to talk about like playfulness and design. I, I knew that this, the, the seller stool I want to talk about, that I knew that that was like um, a very famous design. Uh, and it was by, if I pronounce it correct, or, uh, correct, Achille Castiglione. And he was a very famous architect and designer in Italy from the 50s to the 70s. So I was confused. Was it okay to be playful in design or was it not? So, also I was confused about other things in life at that point, and I didn't feel stable um, in, in many ways, because around that time that I was studying, uh, Greece entered a very bad state of economic crisis, and I started to be, well, I was already, but at that point I was like too much pessimistic and very cynical, and I was thinking that this is not an optimal time for a new beginning. Um, how can it be like an industrial designer in Greece? That the country has no industry anyway, and the crisis, the, they would not help to get any better. So where would I get a job? And even if I was lucky to get a job in design, how could I apply this new way of thinking? So I could not imagine any scenario of working professionally, you know, like as a designer and being asked to, you know, like design a chair. And then I would say to my boss or to my client, oh, you know, let me rethink what it means to sit down, you know, like maybe a chair is not a solution, you know, <laughs> like, you know, the things that we were taught in the, in the postgraduate program. Uh, well, I was over, oversimplifying things. It, things are not exactly like that, but in my head at that point, <laughs> that was a problem. Um, and for this and other personal reasons, I quit. I, I actually never finished my studies in design and I returned back to Athens. Uh, and for a while I was determined not to go back to architecture because I hated it at that point. And I did try um, one more time to change my career. I went to briefly in advertising, which that was a disaster. Um, and then after all that journey of, you know, like cynicism and denial and all that, I just, you know, I said to myself, okay, it's a time to stop trying. I, I went back, I worked as an architect, I worked the eight hours a day, uh, and I got used to the idea that now I have to be responsible, I have to be responsible with my money, and I have to be a serious person. Okay, and then one year later, after being like, after accepting the idea that I will never do anything playful in my life, um, I designed this sketch. And it reminded me of this term that I learned in the design studies, the user experience. Because when you interact with an object, you will get through some steps to achieve your end goal. And this is connected to the conceptual model that we were talking about before. Uh, but if any of these steps are hard, it can make your experience frustrating. And although you will probably achieve your goal, you might end up having a bad experience. So this toilet was a very good example of a bad user experience translated in real life. Because it gives you all the tools to achieve your end goal. And you can actually use that toilet successfully. But imagine how it would be if you had to go to the toilet in the middle of the night, barefoot, and you had to climb that ladder, or if you had like a toilet, you know, like emergency, you know, like emergency. <laughs> I wouldn't think it would be very pleasant. So, I, th so that's how it started the Uncomfortable Project. <laughs> I did that sketch, and what happened without me realizing is that I learned a way of thinking for design when I was in school, but I reversed it. I basically asked the wrong question. I asked how would the objects be if me as a designer was trying to give the user a bad user experience? And it felt so liberating because this time I didn't have any responsibility, any of these responsibilities that kept weighing me as an architect and as a designer. And after consuming all that content from the internet, I ended up doing something similar. I took forms that we all recognize and I put a spin on them to create a surprise. And that's probably why the project I think had a huge success in social media because it's basically the same recipe 
as the things I was consuming in social media. So basically, I'm going to start going a bit faster now because I realized I'm out of time. <laughs> so basically, what I do is I choose an object and I use simple everyday objects because we all understand how they are, what they are, and how they work, and they all have very strong mental model of them. Then I analyze all the steps in the user interaction and I look for the physical affordances and limitations of the object. And then I try to sabotage only one of these elements. And this sabotage has to be very discreet because if I change too much the form of the object, then it stops being a chair. So you basically, I basically try to keep the mental model intact. So the brain recognizes the object, but at the same time, it automatically gets into simulation mode and analyzes the elements and find out that something's wrong with it. And that's why some people have very strong visceral reactions because the problems occurs in the simulation mode when they see it in their brain. So these three chairs, the, the yellow, the gray, and the red one was, was the, the chairs that I did like when I first started the project. And they all have something wrong with the sitting surface because to me, that's what all the chair was like, the sitting surface at that point. The one is curved, the other one is sloped, and the third one only gives you half of the sitting surface. But the chair is more than a sitting surface. If you analyze it, it has so many more properties. It must be rigid, it must be at the right height, the sitting area and backrest must be at a certain angle. It is a movable object for one person only, and the sitting area must be accessible by that person. So in the black chair over here, I have sabotaged just the accessibility to the sitting surface and, and nothing else. And I really enjoy this, uh, this process and the way of thinking because it feels like a puzzle or a challenge. Um, basically, um, the chair was not an easy object. And this, this specific idea for the black chair came to me years after the, the first ones. And to me, that's very impressive because it shows how deeply ingrained these forms are in our minds because we take them for granted. So the useful side of this project is that it actually helps people realize that the tools we, we use every day, they're very well designed. Some co because some concepts like comfort, you can only perceive them basically when they're absent. Like, and that's why they say that good design is usually invisible because when something works really well, you basically, it just, it goes unnoticed. You don't really notice it. So uh, that is my project. I, oh wait, I have some, <laughs> just a little bit more just to show you what happened after this. Uh, so it was a project for fun and self-expression. And it ends with something that I would never have thought of because since 2013 it has been going viral every few years and it has been used and interpreted in, in very different ways. These, I'm going to go fast now. These are some ad campaigns. Um, my first ad campaign was in 2015 for the, for the car company Smart, where they illustrated the importance of good design by saying design is nothing if it's not smart. And then we have another ad campaign for Heal, which is a social enterprise devoted to user-friendly justice, uh, where they operate they operate in African countries. And later, one year later, they they asked me to design um, a, I, together to produce a new object, and we decided to do a, an African mini bus taxi, the, which they called it the Mata Two, and that was like a commission. And in 2019, I collaborated with the Brazilian ID agency to make uh, a campaign for AACD, which is an institute for children with disabilities. And they produced five of my objects and they put them in the coffee shop for a day. So people had to sit in the uncomfortable chairs and use the uncomfortable mugs. And then uh, as soon as they understand what ha was happening, they were handed the paper to explain the importance of uh, of the institute's work and uh, they asked for people to donate money to make more prosthetic limbs for children which was really special for me and then we have a lot of users in, ed in education um, sometimes it's used in primary schools this is for the chicago public school system um, Sometimes it's used like as, you know, like in, in art workshops from teachers, many people, uh, many teachers say to me that they use it for UX, UI design um, uh, 
examples like for to teach like design, you know, like in design schools. And I just also wanted to say about the prototypes that I made in 2017, because all of up until then the project was only 3D visuals, and then uh, I started doing the prototypes, which has led me to do a lot of exhibitions. Uh, my first one was in 2017, and then I had another um, one in IKEA, which was uh, again to showcase, um, uh, you know, um, to say to showcase how people um, uh, feel, uh, how people with disabilities feel, and uh, it was dedicated to inclusive design. And the objects were there to show how people might feel when they have to use objects that are not designed for the needs of the user. They are also um, the objects are also uh, used to illustrate a lot of uh, failure or mistakes, and that was one of the exhibition, uh, two of exhibitions in Paris and then in the in the Cité du Design, uh, for which I have also designed this table, which was the social. Uh, distance dinner for two before the pandemic um, and the last one i'm sorry i'm finishing i know i'm out of time <laughs> and that's the most important for me and in the, it's the less known thing about my project but for me it's the most really i feel really proud of that uh, it's in a collaboration i have done with neuropsychologists from the university of bologna where they used images and later we also produced physical objects um, of the uncomfortable and the corresponding comfortable ones to measure the reaction time in the brain in the neural system. Uh, so basically they told me that when you see an object like a mug, the nerves in your hand are activated just by seeing it because the brain recogni recognizes the handle. But these scientists found out that this does not happen with the uncomfortable. Uh, so this delay in response helped them to do experiments in people with motor skill problems in their hands. Um, you know, like, and that was very important to me that I could be a part of, you know, research and, and things like that. And since then, I've also been um, requested a few times, like this, the, the pair of the, of the images, the uncomfortable, the comfortable and the uncomfortable one. And the researcher um, started using uh, fMRI machine that allowed them to explore the different brain regions that process visual information and how the information flows between the different brain regions and stuff like that. Which uh, to me, I don't know, it's, uh, it's really an honor to be a part of research like that. And I want to end this presentation by showing you my newest chair, uh, which is not uncomfortable, but it's definitely not normal. Uh, it's um, uh, I've started to do animations, uh, and um, so uh, this has helped me come out with uh, showcase the ideas that I have in my head for a very long time, but I couldn't capture in a picture. So the, my latest work is more about time and hypersurfaces, but it still challenges the norms of everyday objects. And the last thing I wanted to say is that preparing this presentation, I started to think about uh, what um, that we don't really need chairs in this um, virtual environment. And so by doing this lecture, I feel like, like a, a historian it, that I present in the digital space something that's absolutely useless in here that, and we can't use it. So with this thought, I would like to leave you. <laughs> and thank you very much for being here. And hearing my stuff and I will let I will let this animation play. Oh, why doesn't this animation play? No. I'm sorry. I have put it the um... <laughs> oh, oh god. I don't know if you can see this uh, this slide that's supposed to be an animation. Ah, uh, okay. I see the animation. Well, it's an animation, but I'm going to try to re-upload yeah, I think guys. it's visible for really some like people, um, but yeah, I also okay. don't see it. No! <laughs> you have to go to my Instagram and see it. It's really nice. Oh, maybe it was on purpose, so like... everyone goes to your Instagram. I see. I see what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, 
anyway, I don't know. Let me feel it even we upload. Anyway, um, I'm open to questions. I'm really happy that you came up and I'm open to questions. Yes. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Katerina. It was an amazing presentation. And yes, the floor is open for questions. Uh, if anyone has any any sort of questions for her or comments, etc. Well, as people are thinking about which question to do first, <laughs> Uh, I actually, I, I have a comment. I actually, I didn't know. This is the first time I'm hearing yeah. about your involvement with the research, you know, seeing the yeah. neurological response yeah. to affordances and that and how uh, that can help people with yeah. motor yeah. skills. Uh, this is actually incredible. How did you, how did you get I, started I with that? I don't, well, as, as with everything with the Uncomfortable Project, I just get, I just got contacted uh, by the people there um, and I just worked with them, you know, like I never, I, I never really initiate any of the things that happen with the uncomfortable. It's always someone else, you know, like that contacts me to do stuff. Uh, but I just thought that, that, I just thought that that was really important. Like I, I just felt that at this point, yes, I have done a funny project and yes, you know, like I never wanted responsibility and that's why I design uncomfortable objects but then at that point i felt like okay but this is now becoming a bit useful you know <laughs> this is actually working for them it actually helped them that it wasn't it wasn't that they were studying the uncomfortable they they were trying to study the motor skills of the hand it was just that they realized that the with the uncomfortable they had more time to study the nerves in the hand it was it was it's incredible I don't know how they found me. I never asked. Uh, and I have, I have been contacted with from other researchers too, but it's not something that happens really often. It has happened like two or three times now. Um, yeah. No, that that's incredible. And uh, I would like to point out to one part of your presentation that you know. Well, first off, thank you so much for everything. Like the presentation is absolutely mm -hmm. mind blowing. And I had to smile from beginning to end in my face. Um, <laughs> and I'd like to, to call attention to this one part that you were talking about how good design is invisible, right? And it's only yes. until yes. you have a issue or a problem that design becomes, mm -hmm. you know, part of the things that you're noticing. Um, and uh, looking at your whole work and the idea of the uncomfortable itself is bringing attention to this, right? Is calling out mm -hmm. elements of design that would be otherwise invisible if they worked perfectly, right? So uh, mm -hmm. I just want to, you know, point out like congratulations on like bringing such an important topic and such a, a profound effect with your collection. And um, I, I, I really wished, you know, that um, I'm, I'm not sure, like this is part of education in a way. It's a different way of, of educating furniture itself. Um, and I'm really glad you brought that mm -hmm. forward. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's something that I think that's why the project is still, you know, like still has like the attention it has. Um, because it, it does that, like it brings attention to a problem, which is things, which is a thing that I, I like always to do, you know, I'm always focusing on the problems, which is not good for me, but anyway. Um, and I think that's why it's still relevant and it has been used in education, in education a lot. Um, and and there are, and that, and I, I think I've done the same thing as when when Don Norman wrote his book, the the design of everyday things. Uh, he used the work of uh, Zach Karman, which is very similar to mine. Like if you it's if you go if you go and Google search him, you will find things that are very you know imaginative. He did it from a different perspective, um, so. So Don Norman, which was like an educator, used his work, uh, Zach Carlman, to to illustrate things that you know about the affordances and things you know like in the design of objects. Um, 
And now I think that's, you know, what's happening with my, my objects now. Uh, and, um, and it's because, and I think another, other, also other artists have done things like that, like, um, to, to take something and, you know, redesign it or, you know, make it more imaginative or uncomfortable or something, but maybe, maybe I just did it a lot, you know, I did many, too many objects. <laughs> Uh, so, so there, so, so there are definitely also other artists that did that. But I think I did it from the perspective of a designer. I did it as a reaction to my design studies, and that's why it has this quality in it that has to do with the design of objects. While maybe other artists, you know, like have different, they start from a different point, so maybe the essence is a bit different. I don't know. Um, but yeah. It's uh, to me, it's incredible because I wasn't trying to do that. Definitely not. Whoops, I'm trying to upload my new chair now. Can you see now? Yes, yes, I can. Cool, nice. Um, so yeah, um, if you have any other questions, um, I'm open to discussing. Um, but I mean, I have many questions. <laughs> if anyone has, all right, Camilla, you have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure that I heard very well. Could you please repeat the question because the. Um, Sorry, uh, I was talking about the design process or, or uh, how do you tweak the everyday object? Uh, how do you measure inconvenience? How, how do you say, mm -hmm. okay, this is the most inconvenient this object can be? Uh, when do you yes. say that? When do I say that? Basically, I, I do, well, I don't do that anymore because I started the project 10 years ago, but then when I when I when I did the most of the objects, I had like um, a methodology where where the first thing I would do is really analyze the object. Like in my head, I was analyzing all the steps, and then when I was in the part of um, making it uncomfortable, I usually rejected the first two three ideas that I had because I thought, okay, these probably are the you know, the, the most common ones that everybody would have them because, you know, you, you also want to be original, right? Uh, but then I think the, the ideas that really were coming through and that I really was deciding to actually design in 3D was the ones that were making me laugh. Like, I would design something and I would laugh out loud <laughs> with what I have designed as if someone else has designed it, you know, like, I think because our brain is so connected to these forms, I would surprise myself by designing it, them differently. You know? So basically, I, I would do, I would brainstorm and do sketches, and what, when I laughed, and the mo the one that made me laugh the most, laughing the most, that was the one that you know I would uh, start doing. The, I would go to the next step, like doing the three D and stuff. So the the measure was uh, how how much would I laugh about it? How much it w because I was laughing because of the surprise. How much it would surprise me? If it surprised me, then it was good. It was good enough. Good. And that's the whole premise of humor in itself, right? Humor is when yeah. we would find humor in things that are surprising some some way or another, or take take the subject yeah. from a different perspective that no one is ex ex well expecting. Um, and that, that's a good metric, actually, <laughs> if you think about it, yeah. like you, it, you stop designing when I, you can't stop laughing. Yes. And I think it's the, I think the project, I, I basically started it because I was very miserable. So I, I was trying, 
it was very comforting for me, you know, like I was basically making myself uh, laugh. <laughs> I was making myself have fun. And then I started to realize that also other people like to think like that. So then I would discuss it with my friends and my friends would also come up with ideas. And then, you know, we might end up like, you know, two or three hours discussing about, you know, like how would an uncomfortable, I don't know, cigarette would be and we would be all night on about it. So it also made me very popular. <laughs> so it was like, it, it wasn't only me that I liked this, you know, like I, I, I saw that other people liked this way of thinking too, um, which was nice. I like all your outfits. <laughs> Everybody's wearing different and nice outfits here in the virtual space. <laughs> well, <You do> something. <laughs> this is what I love about it. Um, and yes, I yeah. mean. Uh, Katharina, this was an amazing, amazing presentation. I cannot thank you enough for, for bringing this forward and sharing that with us today. I hope everyone took something from this as well. And uh, I mean, I, I can't wait to see what's next, you know, like the, the next stuff you're doing and all. I really hope at some point we can have you again here at the Second Bloom stage. Um, and this was absolutely a treat. So thank you so much again. I hope oh. everyone had a great time. Thank you. And uh, if you guys Thank do you. have any other questions, uh, I would love to invite you, Katerina, to join us in our Discord community. Um, and then mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. anyone has any questions later on, they can reach out to you, ask you there, um, and that would be amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. I had a lovely time. And uh, yeah. Hope to see you. I, I am on the Discord server, so, you know, I'd like to join in the conversation. So, have a good uh, day. Have a good day. Here's going to be night in Greece. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You too. And yeah. thank you everyone for joining us here today as well. I mm -hmm. hope to see you all on Discord again. And also next week we have a, a great dive line as well from Nuke Goldstein. And he's going to be talking about, you know, the... Uh, the crypto world and his involvement in that so hope you guys are excited as well so have a great friday everyone and see you next time fly deep bye bye